This program was sponsored by the Jesse and John Dance Fund. Since 1962, these lectures have been a forum for distinguished scholars of national and international reputation who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. My name is Marshall Andolt, and on behalf of the University of Washington Graduate School, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening for the Dan's Lectureship. I uh, realize that the security measures this evening are somewhat extraordinary for our typical Dan's Lecture, uh, and we apologize for the inconvenience, but it is important that we do that this evening, so I hope you'll bear with us. It is my distinct honor to welcome this evening our speaker, Morris Dees. After witnessing firsthand the painful consequences of prejudice and racial injustice, Morris Dees co-founded the Southern Poverty Law Center in 1971. The Southern Poverty Law Center is a nonprofit organization specializing in lawsuits involving civil rights violations and racially motivated crimes. In recent years, civil suits filed by the SPLC have bankrupted or financially crippled several white supremacy groups. They include a $15 million judgment in 1998 against Horace King, South Carolina leader of the Ku Klux Klan for conspiring to burn black churches. In 1990, a $12.5 million award was made to the family of an Ethiopian student killed in Portland, Oregon by a skinhead gang organized by the California-based White Aryan Resistance. Here in our own area, we're very well familiar with the September 7, 2000 Idaho jury verdict in which the jury returned a $6.3 million civil judgment against the Aryan Nations and its founder, Richard Butler. Morris Dees is the chief trial counselor for the SPLC, and he continues to devote his time to suing hate groups, developing ideas for teaching tolerance, and mapping new directions for the center. Please join me in welcoming Morris Dees. Thank you very much for having me here in your school and your community to be with you tonight, share our feelings and our attitudes about getting along with each other. Earlier this evening, I was, before I came, I was in my hotel room watching President Bush talk about his education program. And there is one thing I agree with him on. As he was reflecting back on his experiences with his teachers, I guess he was defending his three strikes you're out program he has for schools. He, he said the teachers that probably meant the most to him were his elementary school teachers. He couldn't remember their names, but he did remember that they did play a big role in his life. And you know, it, may, it reminded me about my elementary school teachers too. One in particular, Mrs. Vera Bell Johnson. And I promise you, had every person in this United States had Mrs. Vera Bell Johnson and been one of our 15 people in that little rural school that she taught in the fifth and sixth grade, we were both in the same room. America would not have many of the problems it has today because she was definitely interested in us leading good moral lives. And in particular, she was obsessed with us ever smoking a cigarette or drinking alcoholic beverages. <laughs> and every, every day, and I do remember, every day we had to say a little poem at the beginning of the class in unison. <clears throat> On this issue of smoking, 
We had to say tobacco is a filthy weed and from the devil does proceed. <laughs> it picks your pockets and burns your clothes and makes a smokestack of your nose. <laughs> and I've never smoked a cigarette to this day. <laughs> and then my wonderful elementary school teacher wore a button, yay big around, on her dress. She was quite old. She had taught my father and myself and two of my boys. And Mrs. Johnson had worked in the great campaign about prohibition. And I think she had that button left over from that campaign because <laughs> on it it said, lips that touch wine shall not touch mine. <laughs> and one day she was going on and on and on about drinking. And I said, but Miss Johnson, you told us last week that Jesus turned water into wine. And she said, yes, Morris, but we'd have thought a whole lot more of him if he hadn't have done that. <laughs> now, I'm sure that President Bush and Pat Robinson would probably like to reinstate that kind of leadership in our schools. And if it would cut down on drinking and smoking, I'm all for them. But you know, every morning we walked out in front of that little school and we put our hands on our hearts and we pledged allegiance to the flag. And I remember how proud I was then to do that and how proud I felt to be an American. And as I grew up in that rural, rural community not far from where I live, Dr. Martin Luther King became the pastor of a church in our community, our town, Montgomery. And I think it's kind of appropriate tonight that we remember Dr. King, whose birthday was celebrated last week, a man who taught us so much and led us during a very troubling time in our nation's history. A man who, in order to have America live up to its promises of equality, written in our Constitution in 1776, had to face contemporaries, many of his own race, with little foresight. He had to face politicians with no backbone. And finally, a terrorist with no conscience. But 30 years after the death of Dr. King, it's the Reverend Martin Luther King that we remember, not those who foolishly stood in his way, a true American hero. And as I was thinking over the last week about the movement in Dr. King, I thought that, you know, we've come a long way in this nation. We have a lot to be proud of as people and as citizens of this great nation. And I didn't come here tonight in any way to put our country down. There are great opportunities for all in this nation. But that being said, 32 years or so after the death of Dr. King, there is still an ill wind blowing across our country. The FBI tells us that last year, over 10,000 hate crimes were committed in America, some very serious. September a year ago, a guard of the Aryan Nations compound walks into a Jewish community center in Los Angeles and shoots up innocent little children. And in the not too distant past, two members of the Klan down in Texas drug James Bird to his death behind a pickup truck. And not too far from here in Cheyenne, Wyoming, Matthew Shepard was beaten, taken out in the desert and tied to a fence where he died simply because of his sexual orientation. In 1995, there was one hate website on the internet. And today there are 450 spewing the worst hate that you can imagine. The 
There's a battle going on in our nation today. It didn't just start yesterday, but it's intensifying. And you're going to take part in that battle, especially you students here, who are going to live out your life in this next century. You're going to take part in this effort or this battle or this campaign, whatever you want to call it, by either doing nothing and letting other people set the agenda or getting involved to try to make this nation the great country it can be. And that's a battle over whose America is this and whose version of America is going to prevail. And I promise you, there are people who feel very strongly about their version of America. They feel strong enough to drive a truck loaded with 4,000 pounds of fuel oil soaked ammonium nitrate fertilizer up in front of a federal building and explode it with little or no thought to the innocent men, women, and children inside. And when Timothy McVeigh drove away from the Murrah Federal Building, he couldn't have helped but have felt that awful explosion, probably shook the car he drove in. And when he did, and it may come as a surprise to you, he thought of himself as a hero, as a patriot, as a good soldier, making sure that his version of America prevailed. We handled a case not far from here. In fact, I came to this town a couple of times interviewing witnesses for this case a few years ago that I think illustrates this battle that's raging in our country. We represented a family from Ethiopia, a family who had a small farm, very poor people, had a son at 24 years old, had finished the school in Addis Ababa, had made good grades, and this young man, Mulugeta Sarah, was able to get a scholarship to a college in Portland, Portland Community College. And he had to leave his wife and small son behind. His father took him to the airport to leave, and he got ready to board the plane he embraced his father and said goodbye. He said, Dad, I am so proud to be going to America, a great nation. I've heard so many wonderful things. I'm told that if I work hard and save my money and stay out of trouble and get a good education, I've got a good chance of getting ahead. And Dad, I'm going to make you proud of me. And when Mulligetta got to Portland, he had to work hard because he had to send money back home. And he got a job at Avis, driving people from the airport in a van out to where the cars were parked. And oftentimes, people would leave an umbrella or some personal item on his van, and he would use his own money to send it back. And for his good deeds, his personnel file began to fill up with letters of praise. And he was elected while he was still a student Employee of the Month for Avis Rent-A-Car. But there was another man who lived 1,200 miles to the south of Portland, Oregon, down in Fallbrook, California, who had a different idea about America. His name was Tom Metzger. You may have heard of him. He's been on all the talk shows at 55, having had a failed political career. He sets up an organization called the White Aryan Resistance of War, W-A-R. And he began to organize skinhead groups around the nation. He had some 50 such groups when we confronted him. And he told his followers that America is a great nation. They had great opportunities in America. But America is going to fall from its position of greatness like other nations before us, like the Roman Empire, unless we get those people out of our midst who are bringing us down. And he called those people mud people. Anybody that wasn't white Anglo like, Mex like Metzger, Americans of African descent, Asian descent, Latinos, Jews, and others. And he told his followers that it's necessary to go in the streets and create acts of racial conflict, we know them as hate crimes, 
to hurry on the day that there'll be a race war and these people will be expelled from our nation. And he sent one of his organizers up to Portland to organize a skinhead group there. And this young man had been there three or four days and had met with a group of skinheads and he told them Metzger's message, the need to have acts of racial violence. And around midnight, three young men who had heard his message went out on the streets and they saw a young black man get out of a car and walk towards an apartment building. They rushed over to him and taunted him and punched him in the chest and called him racist names. And it was Miller Getta coming home from his job at Avis, getting ready to go to school the next day. And he said, peace, peace, please, no trouble. May I help you? And while they continued to taunt him, one walked around behind him, had a baseball bat tucked down behind his pants. And from Melagata's blind side, he took a full swing and hit him in the back of the head and crushed his skull. And Melagata died that night. The police quickly caught the three skinheads who committed this act, and they got long prison sentences. I got a call from a lawyer for the Ethiopian family asking if we wouldn't go out to see about bringing a civil lawsuit because they had lost their breadwinner to see if we could find somebody to pay for this horrible act. I met with the police. They were very helpful. But they said, these three skinheads that committed this, they're in prison. They have no chance of ever having any money. You're wasting your time. And I was about to leave, and one of the officers pulled a handwritten letter out of a file. He said, I found this when I searched their rooms the night after we arrested them. And it was a letter from Metzger. He said, this may help you. It said, when you, to the skinheads there, when you meet Dave, our organizer, he'll teach you how we operate. And he elaborated. And he closed his letter by saying, I hope your group will join the white Aryan resistance. Sign Tom Metzger for a white America. I had our investigators track down this day. We had some intelligence that he had left Metzger. I found him, 21 years old. Very disturbed young man who had lots of problems in his life. Over several weeks, I talked to him and convinced him to be a witness to tell the jury that Metzger had him come up and encourage these people who committed this act to actually use acts of violence. But he did. He said, I felt so important when Metzger made me his national vice president on the Sally Jesse Raphael show. But now I see what I've done is so wrong. Well, Dave came and he testified and we put on other evidence. And at the close of the trial, Metzger, who was a good speaker, wanted to make his closing statement to the jury. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I was 1,200 miles away. I didn't know the victim. I didn't know the people that killed him. I was simply exercising my free speech rights. And it would be a bad decision to rule against a group because of our views. And he continued to talk, and he became very erect as he closed his argument out. And as he stood there and began to speak, I could see the images of Adolf Hitler and those movie tone newsreels I saw at the end of World War II that you now see on the History Channel. He did everything but give a Sieg Heil salute. And he said, I'm going to tell you, I don't apologize for my views. I believe America is a great nation because of the contributions of white people. And he sat down. I stood there for a while thinking what I might say. I knew his free speech argument held no water because he did encourage violence. But still, three people were in jail, and why would a jury want to take this man's property and assets and all? I said, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to look at those young people sitting behind Mr. Metzger on the front row of this courtroom. They're his three children. And not a single one of them had to worry about getting polio because of the genius of the Jewish doctor, Jonas Salk. And if we lived in Tom Metzger's America, we wouldn't have the brilliance of the African-American general, Colin Powell, at the time we were involved in that war. 
And I told that jury the contributions of other people from other different ethnic and racial backgrounds and told the jury their contributions to the greatness of this nation. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, the America that Tom Metzger believes in is an America that never existed. Our nation is great because of our diversity, not in spite of it. And I think that jury agreed with me in a unanimous way because they returned the largest civil verdict ever returned in the history of the state of Oregon. And I wish Tom Mesca had. <laughs> Thank you. And I wish Tom Mesca had the $12.5 million. That was what the jury thought this thing was worth. I wish it was the lottery and we could just punch a ticket. But we did take everything he had, his property, his business. And today, he still has to send a sizable check every month to that family in Ethiopia. You know, as I was leaving Portland, going home to my family, having been away from my farm and my family for about a year working on this case, relaxing for the first time in that airplane as it reached cruising altitude, trying to feel to myself, what did this piece of litigation mean to me personally? As I relaxed and looked out the window going home, I looked down at the this nation passed below the Rockies and the Great Plains with the farms and crops all lined up in the fields and finally coming in over the Appalachian Mountains into Atlanta. I thought to myself, you know, I really believe what I told that jury. I believe that our nation is great because of the contributions of all of us. But why? So late in the history of this nation, why can't we all get along? We became very concerned and troubled at the Law Center, especially the people working on tolerance education programs, at the awful increase in the number of hate crimes in America, especially those serious, violent hate crimes. And we began to look around this nation to see what is going on. What are people thinking? And I'll have to tell you, we found good news. People in this nation all over this country from north to south and east to west are saying we're better than that. These people don't represent us. And we found two things. First, that people in this country are reaching out to the victims of hate crimes and saying, we support you. We feel your pain. We're with you. And then people are organizing groups, small and large, all over this country, community, countywide, citywide, and national in scope, to work to build bridges over those divides that separate us in this nation. Divides along the lines of color, which create the largest number of hate crimes and acts of discrimination some subtle and systemic in this nation. Along the lines of sexual orientation that probably account for a larger percentage of hate crimes than any other subject, but one that's severely undercounted because simply to report such a crime exposes an individual to ridicule and sometimes the loss of status and a job in the community. Along the lines of those who are old on one side and young on the other, those that are handicapped or have emotional or mental problems, those who are old and young, hate crimes along the lines of class, that deep division that separates those on one side who have wealth and property and assets and those that don't. You know those divides that separate us. And as we begin to collect the stories of people the, all over this nation, we found those that were very heartening, that bring out the best of us in this country. Some would even bring tears to your eyes to hear them. I remember one story from Billings, Montana, a small town, pretty homogeneous population, few minorities, few Jewish people, and a Jewish family that had purchased their young son a menorah to use during Hanukkah, to hold the Hanukkah candles. 
And he was so proud of this menorah, and each night during Hanukkah, he'd light a candle, and he placed it in a position so it could be seen from the street. And somebody saw it who didn't like it. And they threw a brick through the window, and it crashed to the floor. His parents thought it should be put in a less conspicuous place. But someone else saw that or heard about that incident in that community, a business person. He wasn't Jewish. He had a business that had a big marquee where he advertised the products he sold in front of his store. And he took the words down selling his products and in their place had put the words, not in our town. And he began to organize along with others, schools, law enforcement, churches, and others, the making of paper menorahs out of cardboard. And they had them placed in every window facing almost every, in every house facing the streets in Billings, Montana, in support of the victims of that hate crime. And one evening after this campaign was underway, this mother and father took their little son around to see. And they drove up one street and down the other late in the evening. He could see these menorahs backlit from the lights inside. It was quite a sight. And he turned to his parents and said, you know, Mom, Dad, I didn't know so many Jewish people lived in Billings. <laughs> and he said, and his mother said, no, son, they're our friends. And therein, I think, lies the answer. When bridges are built across these divides that separate us in this country, along so many lines, they create so much intolerance and hatred and bias and prejudice and frustration and anger. Those bridges were built in friendship and love for one another. Now, I think it's important that we love our family members, that we spend time with our families, Actually, I love some of my family members in spite of them. <laughs> I've got an uncle, he's deceased now, who kept a Klan robe, a Ku Klux Klan robe, hanging in the back closet of the country store he ran at the crossroads where we had our cotton farm. Fortunately, he changed his views before he passed on, but even back then, you know, I still loved my uncle because I knew some good things about him too. I knew some of the good things he did in the community in spite of his awful blind spot. And I think, you know, it's important to love those people and care about them and appreciate them that we work with, that we sit at the lunch table with every day, that we go to our churches, mosques, and synagogues with, that we sit in class with, that we socialize with. That's important too. But what I'm talking about is building bridges across those divides that separate people that are different than we are. People that you don't always associate with, someone whose eyes might have a different shape, skin a different color, hair a different texture than yours, who might have a different sexual orientation, a different religion, or no religion at all. You know the differences. It's understanding and accepting and appreciating each person for what they bring to America's table. And that's easier said than done. But I think that as a nation, especially with the young people like you here tonight, the students here, we're going to solve those problems. There's a great challenge for us to solve those problems. Because by the year 2050 in this country, just along issues of race alone, forget all the other differences, census takers tell us that people like myself and most of you are going to be in a minority in this nation. And if we're to maintain a democracy where the majority rules, then we're going to have to deal with some of these issues and solve them because there's going to be changes. And it's not just coincidental that in Florida, where we had this close election decided that it happened in Florida. 
Because Florida, especially the area that made that close difference, already reflects what this country is going to look like 25 and 30 years from now in its population. And we dealt with some very serious issues in this election. It was not just Tweedledee, Tweedledum. They were serious issues. And people there voted almost equal numbers for each candidate because they understood the seriousness of these issues. But I think that we're going to reach that time in the middle of this next century as a successful nation. Because there have been dark times in the history of this nation before, and we dealt with those problems all throughout our history, dealing with so many issues. I remember some of those dark times. I remember 1963. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was 10 days out of the Birmingham jail. And he was no hero. You should read sometimes the letter that he wrote to the pastors of Birmingham, many of his own race, who were criticizing him openly for using children in the face of dogs and fire hose. I was three years out of the University of Alabama Law School then. But you know, Dr. King, who was certainly to become our hero, did not lose faith in us then. And that was one year before that was a Civil Rights Act, two years before that was a Voting Rights Act, 1963, when powerful politicians in Washington stood and protested and filibustered against basic, simple human dignity in this nation. But Dr. King didn't lose faith. And the people that were present then and those to come he went to Washington to express that faith in 1963. He must have had awful pain when he stood there because just a few weeks after he got out of jail, a Klansman had tied sticks of dynamite together and blown up the 16th Street Baptist Church and killed four little Sunday school girls. But with that heavy burden, Dr. King stood at the mall with 250,000 people at his feet and millions watching on television when he expressed faith in all of us. He said that I have a dream that one day in the red clay hills of Georgia, that the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will sit down around the table of brotherhood. Well, a lot's happened since Dr. King walked among us. We've taken three steps forward and two steps back. The issues have changed. I doubt if Dr. King and his followers would recognize the landscape today. But I do believe if he was still here and he was making that speech today, he would also still have faith in us to solve our problems and to live together in peace. And if he was making that speech, he might say that I have a dream that one day in the red clay hills of Georgia, and today he might add on the reservations, in the barrios, in the ghettos, and in the seats of economic and political and judicial power in this nation, that the sons and daughters of former slaves and the sons and daughters of former slave owners and today, he might add, the homeless, the powerless, the poor, and those who hold the keys to the economic and judicial and political power of this nation sit down around the table of personhood and truly learn to love one another. You know, when Dr. King went around this nation at a time when our country had lost so much of its bearing. But we treated millions of our citizens almost as non-citizens. Dr. King understood a very powerful, motivating force. And that's the desire of people for justice. 
He knew that justice had burned in the hearts of men and women since the beginning of time. I remember on that little farm, my daddy would bring home a, a candy bar when he came from the cotton fields. And our favorite candy bar my sister and I had was a Baby Ruth candy bar. And we had a keen sense of justice then because he only brought one. <laughs> and I know about this justice because he'd give it to my sister and she said, he would say, you cut this in half and let your brother choose which half he wants. And I promise you, she'd get out a ruler. <laughs> well, Dr. King also understood that sense of justice too. The longing for fair treatment. And as he went around this country teaching us, he told an old story about another people at another time who faced a crisis like we did. The year was 900 B.C. The Jews, the children of Israel, had wandered in the desert after being slaves in Egypt, had gone from place to place and suffered so much. And finally they settled and built a town near the present site of Jerusalem. And they prospered. They built high walls around this town, and today we'd call it a city-state back then. And they built big gates to protect it, and the marketplaces inside of this town drew people from far and wide to bring their products to sell, and people did well, and they prospered. Many people got nice building lots and built beautiful homes overlooking fertile valleys. And they had a court system, and they had an education system, and a law enforcement system. But there was a farmer who came in to bring his produce to sell. And as he drove his wagon through those gates, heavily, heavy with his products to put in the marketplace, he was bothered. Early in the morning, he waited for those gates to open so he could enter. And he saw able-bodied men and women there begging for food, running along beside his cart asking for food. And upon inquiry, he found that, well, if he didn't know the right people, or if you wasn't the right people, you didn't get a job or a good job at all. Today, today we might call that discrimination. And then as he went into the community, into the town, into the marketplace, and he heard grumbling among the people that the court systems weren't fair, and sometimes you got arrested for things that other people didn't get even stopped for. Today we might call that racial profiling. And this bothered this farmer, and he called for an audience among, from, so he could speak to the leaders, and they granted it because he was a man of some means and reputation. You know this farmer. He was the prophet Amos. And he met with those people and he said, you know, you got a good thing going here. But unless you're fair to all the people, you won't get to keep all this to pass down to your children and their grandchildren down the way. And just in your own best self-interest, you got to treat everybody fair. And he spoke the words of them that you can read in the book of Amos that Dr. King quoted so often as he went around talking to our nation that suffered some of the same problems. He said to those people then, don't be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters. I think it's important for us to understand that there's nothing guaranteed about our country's existence. We've 
been a nation in a short time. And as this nation changes, we're going to be faced with enormous challenges. And it's in our best self-interest that we treat all people fairly in this nation. There are those of us who feel a certain privilege because of who we are or where we came from. But that's the surest way to have a disaster for our country. And when I hear gay and lesbian people complain and want laws passed to protect them, I don't hear people asking for special privileges. I hear people asking for equal rights. Not to be judged by something that has nothing to do with their ability to do a job. And when I hear people of color in this nation complain that we're not treated fairly, and are asking for some help from our government to level the playing field, I don't hear them asking for special privileges like some politicians would make us believe. I hear them simply asking for simple justice. And I think this nation is great enough, smart enough, compassionate enough, and intelligent enough to make room for a place at America's table for all of us. And I know that each of you who is so privileged to be going to this great university and are going to have positions that will influence the way our nation goes, whether it be as a personnel director or a lending officer or a teacher, a professional person, engineer, doctor, lawyer, whatever it may be, I just ask you to search your conscience and to be compassionate and to remember the words of the prophet Amos that you too will not be satisfied until justice does roll down like waters. Thank you so much.